Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to Tyranny. Uh, so today, I'm going to be recording an in-depth tutorial to Tyranny. And that isn't going to be covering the story, that is not going to be covering the characters, that is not going to be covering the dialogue, the side characters, the quest, no. This is a tutorial on the game, the basis of the game, how to create a character, how to go through the campaign, and how to play. Now, this is going to be very, very casual, because I am honestly just making it for a few siblings who tried out the game and got stuck a few times. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and post this online, so that anyone who benefits from it, benefits from it, and cool, good for you. Um, so yeah, it's going to be very casual. Uh, I'm not going to bother with any editing or anything fancy, it's just going to be me going through the character creation, the campaign, and the very, very first uh, tutorial area with you guys. Um, I have played this game six times. I am working on my seventh time. <laughs> it's, a, it's an awesome game. It has an insanely deep world. I'm still discovering new things to, through my seventh run. So, yeah, note for anyone who's come here concerned with that they're missing out on parts of the game and they want to figure out how to play it properly. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a proper way to play Tyranny. I have played it. There are th only three, four, four true endings, technically. Um, no, five. Five? Five true endings. Um, but there's no real way to get there. There's no real way to shape the world. There's no proper way. There are no pros and cons. Everything has pros and cons. And... The way Tyranny works is you play how you play. You make your decisions and you deal with the outcome of those decisions. And literally on my seventh playthrough, I am still discovering new things about this game. I'm discovering new things about the characters that I literally had no idea about. Some of them were like <laughs> world shattering. Big difference. Okay, so we're going to jump right into it. So I am going to take you through the first area. It is really brief. And that's just going to be for um, a combat tutorial. So we're going to start by creating a character. Uh, we're going to go ahead and play on normal, and I'm not going to do... Oh, I, well, I can't do a nuke and plus? Hmm. Well, that's weird. Oh, I might have reinstalled the game, so... Yeah, I don't have my saves. Big sad. Alright. So this is Tyranny. Tyranny, you play as someone called a Fate Binder. You are a member of the court. You are beneath Tunon, who is the Archon of Justice, the ruler of the court. And in this game, evil has already won. It's over. The war is over. Evil already won. And you're on that side. And you work for Tunon, who is the head of the court for the Empire, the evil Empire, Kairos' Empire. For over 400 years. And yeah, I'll quiet down and let you watch the this. The armies of Kairos the Overlord have swept across the known world. All who stood against them fell before their might. Even the Archons, women and men of immense power, were forced to kneel, chained to the Overlord's will. Now Kairos's final conquest has come to our corner of the world, and two of the Overlord's armies compete for the honor of taking our lands. The elite disfavored, and the teeming horde of the Scarlet Chorus. The voices of Narad, spymaster and archon of secrets, guides the fierce and undisciplined masses of the Scarlet Chorus. With each battle, the Scarlet Chorus grows stronger as the defeated are given a simple choice. Serve or die. Grave and Ash, archon of war and the Overlord's most loyal general, leads the disfavored. Though small in number, Kairos's ironclad legion has never met true defeat in open battle. Watching over the two generals is Tunon, the Adjudicator, Archon of Justice, eldest of Kairos's minions. Tunon brings Kairos's laws to newly conquered lands, aided by the Fate Binders, judges and executioners of the Overlord's laws. You were among the youngest of the court of Fatebinders when Kairos' armies came to our lands. How could we have known that the fate of thousands 
would rest in your hands. So yeah, I mean that kind of explained the gist of what I was saying. So the points it made about the um, the disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus are something to really keep in mind when playing this game, and they really hammer them into the extreme. Uh, so, but we'll get into that later. So for now, we are in character creation. So here's our role. In the Northern Empire where you were born, men enjoy equal protections under the law of the overlord Kairos. In the southern lands of the Tears, only men may own or captain ships, but real estate is restricted to women. Men may, t may lease, but durable ownership of the land in Tears always passes to the eldest daughter or sister. Most sons enter their father's profession by their mid-teens. Those without a profession or family lands to work can find purpose by pledging service to one of the Overlord's mighty Archons. Criminals, derelicts, and others are often conscripted into the army of the Archons. If a child cannot forge his own skein, he will certainly find one in battle. So something important to note is that while this most of this character creation will not affect the story, it is for your own personal preference. This is an RPG, it is a roleplay game. You can either roleplay characters through it, or you can roleplay yourself through it. And whenever you see some orange text here, uh, that means that you can hover it, you can right click for more details. We're going to go ahead and read this bit on Kairos. So this is a very in-depth tutorial, I am going to be reading all the text out. <laughs> Alright. Kairos is a name out of legend. For centuries, the Overlord has consolidated power, sending vast armies to swallow entire realms. The most powerful mystic the world has ever seen, Kairos can issue edicts, magical proclamations that level cities, spread pox, sur sunder the lands, or change the course of seasons. The Archons, the masters of magic throughout the known world, bow to Kairos, and the Overlord readily destroys any Archons unwilling to kneel. These sorceresses and mad madmen lead the Overlord's armies in near endless conquest. As the realms of the known world fall to the Overlord, th these captured territories are divvied up amongst the Archons to manage. Able to deliver suffering and woe to every corner of Teratus without leaving the capital, few have seen the Overlord in person. Though Kairos' name is the single most recognized name in the world, only the Archons can say what the Overlord looks like. And that's actually going to be a big deal in the game. No one knows what Kairos looks like. No one knows if Kairos is a male or a female. No one even knows who or what Kairos is. The Archons have met them, but they don't talk about him. Him, her. Oh. Alright, so we're going to swap over to female. So, roll. In the Northern Empire where you were born, women enjoy equal protection under the laws for the Overlord Kairos. In the Southern Lands of the Tears, women may crew a ship, but only men may own or captain a vessel. While these customs give the oceans to men, the land are trusted to the women. Men may rent and lease, but only women may own land and bequeath it to their daughters and sisters. While following a parent's profession is standard, many women choose to pledge service to one of the Overlord's powerful Archons. Those without a viable trade or land to call their own are often drafted into the army of the Archons, where it is assumed they will rise to glory or vanish in obscurity in accordance to their worth. So, in the Northern Empire, which is where Kairos is uh, Overlord, Men and women are treated equal, as equals, uh, and it's a merit-based system where they gain what they deserve, basically. They gain what they prove that they can accomplish. And in the south, in the tiers, um, women were owners of the land and men were owners of the seas. So, I mean, it might you might consider that um, uh, equal. Sorry, brain fart. Alright, so there isn't a whole lot of character customization in Tyranny. It's not really a big deal, honestly. A lot of people like to be able to customize their characters a great deal. But it, in this game, you won't um, you won't really be seeing your character much. <laughs> it is an asymmetric RPG, so it's a top-down view. You don't see your character a whole lot unless you're putting gear onto them. So we're going to go with something basic. We're going to go with this guy, give him some nice skin I mean I don't know what is nice skin that's totally so yeah <laughs> make whatever you want um, that's totally relative okay so face and hair portrait I have the portrait pack the tyranny portrait pack a lot of people complain that it was overpriced for a bunch of pictures but let's be real you can commission like 
five to fifteen dollar pieces of art off DeviantArt, it wasn't a ripoff. And even if it was, I bought it because I wanted to uh, support the developers. So, anyways, we're gonna go through this real quick because this is not that important. I'm just gonna make someone basic whose face appeals to me. You look okay. <laughs> I'm so judging all of a sudden. That's a nice hair. That's some nice hair. Oh, he's got a frontal part. Hey, that's pretty cool, too. Yeah, so, again, not a big deal how they look like. There aren't a lot of options for hair, but, you know, whatever. Alright, I like the long hair. We'll go with the long hair, and we'll make it dark brown. Yeah. And tattoos. Um, if you choose tattoos, they come with their own uh, colors that you can adjust. Uh... Let's go with something simple. That's kind of cool. So you have your secondary and your primary colors. Let's make it black with a red dot, kind of like a like a black widow. All right, now voice. There aren't a hell of a lot of voices either. You know, it's a pretty standard isometric RPG style. That wasn't so hard. Moving cautiously. We must rest soon. I wouldn't worry too much about the voices if you have voice in your head for your character. You're not really gonna hit the nail on the head with it. Hmm. Have a look here. Heads up, we have company. Good work. This will be fun. That was so hard. We must rest. Soon. On it. That was squeaky. <laughs> to battle! Flawless. I'll just hold on to this. Ah, got it! And if, you know, the constant chatter of characters in an RPG drives you crazy, you can just use to have no voice. I'm gonna go ahead and say right. sneaky voice, because I don't know why it's called sneaky, but it sounds pretty good. And let's give him... Hmm. Oh, we didn't go over facial hair, I'm sorry. Let's give him a nice beard. And that's a pretty good one. Some chops. Chin tuft. Ooh, that's a good beard. And let's. Oh, look, that works, doesn't it? Yeah, the hair's not quite right, but it's close enough. All right, so we're gonna go with that. Now, this is uh, another important part, and this is the history of your character. It will not affect the story, but it will affect dialogue options, and some of those you'll really want. It's really nice to have. None of this matters to the story so don't feel like you're missing out you gotta play the game eight times just to you know unlock everything don't worry about that some of these will sometimes be pretty helpful like uh the diplomat for certain occasions don't and you know they all will honestly it just depends on who you're talking to but it's it's totally dialogue options it's totally for the role play i enjoy it i hope you guys do we're gonna go ahead and read um should we read all of them how in depth do you guys want this i wonder no you know what this is purely subjective. Purely subjective. This is for roleplay. This is for character creation. I'm just going to read the origin. We'll pick uh, this filler character's role and we'll keep going because you're all sitting here. You know what? You're mostly skipping ahead the video already. You guys aren't interested in this part, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> so, origin. Today, you are a fate binder, agent of the Archon of Justice. You are by no means free... But as a warrior scholar deputized with discretionary powers to interpret and execute the law of the overlord Kairos, you are freer than most. One does not apply to be a fate binder. One is called by Tunon the Archon of Justice, and to decline is death. Millions of men and women live in the dozens of realms ruled by the overlord. How did you stand out from amongst his teeming mass of desperate this teeming mass of desperation and insignificance and gain the Archon's notice? We're gonna go ahead and read Tunon's. Tunon the Adjudicator is the Archon of Justice, ruler of the conquered realm and arbiter of disputes. Oldest of the Archons sent to conquer the Tears, Tunon speaks with Kairos' authority. His true appearance remains hidden behind an iron mask, the face of judgment. Tunon is an impartial, sober creature, wholly obsessed with justice and order. Though assumed to be a powerful combatant, Tunon rarely strays from the throne room and entr entrusting his court of fate binders to act as his eyes and ears, as well as judges, juries, and executioners. Tunon is a very interesting character, and I, um, with no spoilers, I would ask you to not write him off, because <laughs> I think he's super cool. 
So remember, Tunon is your master, and you didn't choose that, you were called upon, and as it mentioned, otherwise is death. So as a Fate Binder, you have a lot of slack, you have a very long leash, you can bend the rules a bit. Tunon will ask you to justify your actions because he is wholly obsessed with justice. And something to note is that Tunon's obsession with justice goes beyond Kairos' laws. Tunon is just the Archon of Justice, period. And he's who you work for, and your job is to bring justice to the tears however you see to be fit and just. Remember, evil has already won. Kairos the Overlord already rules the world. You work for Kairos through Tunon. Your job is not to win wars, your job is to bring law and order. How you choose to do that is what will affect the story, and your relationship with Tunon. Alright, so there are a lot of these. Pit Fighter, Hunter, Guild Apprentice, Noble Scion, Soldier, Lawbreaker, War Mage, Diplomat. For this dude here, we're gonna say... He... He was a Lawbreaker. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. So, in the Lawbreaker's lore, um, you're actually sentenced to your punishment, but you can, uh, basically, Tunon gives you the choice of serving him instead of spending a lifetime in prison. So, you end with that. Alright. Doesn't really matter. It's all subjective stuff, remember that. Alright, so here comes the more interesting part. Primary expertise. So, in Tyranny, you get two expertises. And... These don't particularly matter. They kind of do. These will um, affect your starting skills, not your stats, just your skills. It's nice to have a lot of skills that combo together, or if you're playing it, if you're micro playing a lot, you can mix and match, like put spells on a swordsman or something. Uh, but we'll get into that. So, as one of Tunon's fate binders, you receive training in the arts of war, the intrigue of magic, and the inexhaustible depths of Kairos' law. Excuse me. Across the Northern Empire, the education of a fate binder is second to none. Those bearing the title are expected to read instructions and understand the economies of the realm in which they operate. Literacy and mathematics skills rarely found on Tarot. Tarot. Why can't I speak? Are essential skills in the execution of law. Subtler talents like speechcraft or tactics are honed with time and experience under Tunon's guidance. So, that last part's kind of interesting because... How good do you, Your dialogue options will always give you basically every option you could possibly have. And how good you are at it really just depends on how much you know and how much you learn. Not as a character, but as a player. And it's important to not think that you're missing something, that you messed something up, that you should have done something else. Because the way Tyranny works is that you you take actions based on the best of your knowledge, and you suffer the consequences of those actions, good or bad. And you learn. It's not a short game, by no means is it a long RPG, I, I would put it about 40 hours. But you learn, and you get better. And you can start to understand the politics of the world, and uh... Yeah. I should stop spinning him around and admiring his perfect body. Alright. <laughs> so, for this, um, we are going to go with the basic sword and shield. Yeah. Because we're trying to keep it basic. And so, yeah, there are a lot of options. So, the important thing to note about this is this does not affect your stats. This will affect your starting skill. Okay, it does. My bad. A little bit. So, skills, not ability skills. Sorry, not about these attributes. It does not affect your attributes. It does give you some skills. For example, if you use a sword and shield, one-handed weapons, parry, athletics, as you can see here, and uh, we'll get into those. Javelin, greatsword, dual wielding, short bow, unarmed attacks, like a monk, shock spells, frost spells, vigor spells, atrophy spells. So, there are a lot of options. Um, and then here we'll choose the abilities, but we'll get into that in a second. So, the important thing to note is that these add to your skills, but they do not add to your attributes. And the the most important part is the abilities you're picking. So the way Tyranny's abilities work is they work in uh, ability trees. You might have heard of like the tree tree from many MMOs um, or many RPGs too. 
they all use the trait tree. This one, Tyranny uses the ability tree, so it's basically the same thing, the trait tree. And whatever you choose here, each of these, not each of these, but most of these have their own tree, where they branch off skills from. Spells are a little different, we'll get into that. But say I go with sword and shield, and I take shield slam. There is a defensive ability tree that I now have a skill in. So if I want to build as a defensive unit, I'm going to want to build into that tree anyway, so I'm giving myself a head start with this. If I want to make myself a mage, but I want to start off with some tankiness and I take this, I'm going to have this extra skills that I can't take back. I cannot reallocate that. So bear that in mind when picking your class. So the javelin, um, you, it's a one-handed and thrown weapon. The sword, one-handed weapon, dual wielding, two one-handed weapons, great sword, two-handed weapon, obviously. Short bow, ranged. Unarmed attacks. The one I have... No, I have used this. I was going to say the first one I personally have not used, but no, I have. And then there are spells. So shock spells uh, generally interrupt their enemies. Freeze spells are uh, slowing. Atrophy spells drain their skills and attributes to weaken them, and Vigor spells are buffs. So each of these you will just start with the basic spell of that class. Uh, and this is why I actually do not recommend starting as mages unless you plan to solely work as a mage and never use any other skills. Because you just get a spell. And the way spell working works in Tyranny is a completely separate thing from the ability tree. So you can start as something else, and you can build your spells, and that's perfectly fine. So, if you if you want it for the control frost, or the control atrophy, or, you know, the skills, go for it. Magic staff, you know. You, you get some points in that. Admittedly, this isn't much, and Tyranny works as a practice-based system. The more you, your character uses a skill, the better he gets at it. Every single fight, your control lightning might get a little bit better if you use a lightning spell. Excuse me. So, um, I personally don't recommend going any of the spells unless you plan on solely building as a mage, which I have before, and it's it's fun, it's cool, and if you're role playing, that's another thing to do. So, yeah, there's that. I'm gonna go ahead and pick sword and shield. Really simple. Actually, you know what? Let's go with javelin and shield. And we're gonna pick hobble or heart shot. We're gonna pick heart shot. So then you go to next, and you get a secondary expertise. And you actually can pick the same one again and take another skill for that class. And that is a huge bonus early on. If you want to um, multi-class, you can totally do that in theory. If you want to be a wizard who also uses a javelin, you can totally do that. I believe there's actually a companion that does... Well, the companion's... So, that's the thing. You can build anything you want in Tyranny. You can build yourself however you want to build yourself. If you want to go with the spell secondary, go for it. And you will get these skills from it. So, really, you can do whatever you want. And you can always adjust your skills throughout the entire game as you use them or as you learn them. You don't... You're not stuck with whatever you pick. I like to double up on something... It, because that gives you a boost if you're only planning on going with like the one class if you're planning on going with a second class if you're planning on multi-classing you might want to pick something else and start your trait tree your ability tree there i'm going to go ahead and double up on the javelin because that's yeah, just my preferred way of doing it and we're keeping this simple <laughs> it's already gone way beyond simple and then there's your banner creation so you're not going to see your banner much um you will see it on the world map as you travel around and that is basically it <laughs> you can choose your color of your armor this is customizable at any time i think the banner is as well i don't remember i've never changed it but i think you can in game so yeah your armor you can adjust it anytime you want um parts of it will stay black don't worry about it you can adjust your armor in game and as you get different um different outfits you will probably want to do that so we'll go ahead and just stick with black for now all black or should we go some with some red? Red pants? Red accents? I kind of like the red... No, I don't like the red accents. <laughs> we're going to go with the red pants and... Uh, yeah, there we go. Red pants and black armor. For the banner, we're going to choose uh, sword and shield. Yeah? Not right, cool? No one cares. No one cares. Just get on with the tutorial. Why are you wasting so much time? I'm sorry. I like the game. Okay. <laughs> 
me projecting here. We're going to go with the black and red. That's this guy's theme. You want to swap it up? Nah. That looks good. Okay. Enter name. Ooh. Uh, he shall be... Uh, mm -hmm. Marcus... Dragon <laughs> I didn't think that far ahead. This is really totally casual. I'm honestly just doing this for a few siblings who wanted to try out the game because I heaped praise on it for two years, three years. I don't even know how long anymore. And yeah, if you guys enjoyed, it, cool. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to be choosing our attributes. Uh, there are, of course, the strongly recommended recommended ones. Those will swap around as you uh, choose different different classes to start out on. We're going to go over what each of these are real quick. So, Might. Might determines the physical strength of a character. Increased Might leads to more powerful attacks and stronger abilities, as well as increasing the endurance defense. So, with a Might of 10, that's plus 0% attack and ability strength, plus 0 endurance defense. I don't think you can act. Oh, you can take some off and debuff yourself at the cost of getting points back and, you know, being able to use to spend them elsewhere. So, might. That's the same description. Endurance defense is uh, resist attacks on the internal physical system of the character. Poison, disease, stun, that kind of thing. Defined by the character's resolve and might. Uh, can also be influenced by good items. Yeah. So, it's basically for strength of your abilities and attacks, not your spells, your auto attacks and your abilities, and your endurance defense. So, defense against debuffs. So we're going to take a couple points there. We only have eight points to spend. Remember that? Finesse. The finesse attribute describes the character's physical and mental precision. Finesse is used to determine the accuracy of attacks and spells, as well as increasing worn armor's chances to reduce a hit type. For example, a critical hit, or a, hit, uh, a crit to a hit, or a hit to a graze. So accuracy, all attacks in tyranny compare the attacker's accuracy value of one, to one of five defenses. Parry, direct melee attacks. Dodge, direct range attacks. Endurance, body system attacks like stun and prone. Will, mental attacks. And magic, attacks from spells and spell-like abilities. Accuracy is defined primarily by the attacker's skill with that type of attack, weapon skills for physical attacks, magic skills for spell attacks, etc. It can be influenced by finesse, talents, and other active effects such as spells or items. When an attack is made, the attacker's accuracy is compared to the appropriate defense on the target to determine how the attack roll will be modified. If accuracy is above the target's defense, it will, it will be more likely to result in a, in a hit or crit, less likely to result in a graze or a miss. So, as you can guess, graze is reduced damage, the rest is all straightforward. And then armor deflection. This is one that some people really don't get. Okay. So when an attack hits, armor is the primary means of reducing damage. Armor is usually derived from equipped items, primarily in the chest and helmet slots, though spells, talents, and potions can increase a character's armor. Armor is subtracted directly from all incoming damage. For example, an attack that initially does 20 damage to a target with 7 armor would be reduced to 13. Armor can never reduce incoming damage below 1. Note that many pieces of equipment will grant different armor values against the different damage types. Some types of attacks, such as damage over time effects, burning or poison, etc., and weapon attack procs are only reduced by 25% of the target's armor value, because like, your target doesn't really protect you from burning or poison. Okay, so that's basically what armor deflection is. It's super basic. It's just armor. I don't know why they put deflection. Oh, well, you know, it's kind of two separate things. So, deflection is what it was talking about before, converting grazes to miss and stuff. So, when a character is attacked and the hit result has been determined, the so also, you know, when it hits or miss or whatever, um, the target's deflection percentage is checked. Deflection can reduce an attack by one hit result. Example, a graze can convert to a miss. Deflection is a property of equipable clothing and armor and is also present in talents and abilities. Each modifier to a character's deflection lists the type of hit result it converts, as well as the percentage chance it will do so it will do so when the character is struck. The type of deflections are crit to hit, hit to graze, and graze to miss. The finesse attribute increases the amount of deflection granted by equipped armor. So every single piece of equipped armor you have will grant you a certain amount of armor and a certain amount of deflection, and those are two 
separate stats, even though it shows, you know, armor deflection here. Um, those are two separate stats, and deflection is not dodge either. So your dodge chance is to make it less likely that you will get hit. Your armor chance is to reduce damage if you've been hit. Your armor deflection is to um, reduce the attack hit result. So if someone gets a hit on you, you might be able to convert it into a graze. Usually light armor and medium armor will come with a lot of deflection, while heavy armor will come with a lot of armor to, do to just um, block the damage. So for heavy armor, you'll want to put that on characters with a lot of resolve and might, and, you know, vitality, high health, high um, constitution, basically, so that they can carry heavy armor without being slowed down too much, so that they can soak up damage, and in deflection armor, you will want to put on lighter units with high dodge, who will usually dodge skills, dodge hits, but when they don't dodge, they can't really soak up damage. Heavy armor on them would slow them down too much, they need to be able to hit fast. So, we're going to go ahead and not put any finesse on him for now, we'll come back and see if we have any points left, because I kind of think of him as a tanky boy. Quickness. Quickness determines how often a character can use their abilities and spells in combat, reducing cooldown duration, so it's really simple. Ability and spell cooldowns. It is strongly recommended because you're training a javelin, so javelin is supposed to be a quick weapon. It absolutely does not have to be. You can take double daggers, you can take a bow, you can take a great sword, you can do whatever you want, and make yourself as fast or as slow as you want. And it really doesn't matter, it depends entirely on your playstyle, how you choose to play it. If you choose to be a big tank boy, Maybe you're not concerned with hitting super fast and doing a ton of damage. Especially if you put more points into being tanky than actually having a high accuracy chance. So, perhaps you don't care about how quick you are, and you're more interested in spending your points in other places. So for now, we're not going to put it in quickness, even though we're cleansed it for the jab one. Vitality. Vitality determines a character's physical health and their strength of personality. It also increases the will defense. So, here we have health. Everyone knows what health is. I'll read it anyways, because we're in depth, and you guys are already going to be sitting here for an hour. <laughs> the character's health determines their survivability in combat. Damage that is not absorbed by a target's armor goes straight to their health. Potions and healing spells can restore health in combat. When a character's health reaches zero, they will be knocked out. A knocked out character can be brought back in combat through the use of active abilities. Otherwise, characters will regain health at the end of combat, assuming they're on the winning side. Based on the game's difficulty setting, characters gain wounds when they fall below a specific health threshold during combat, and will gain additional wounds when they are knocked out. Based on game's health settings, a character that reaches zero health can be killed. So that will depend on how hard you're playing it. I like I prefer the wound system. I don't like to uh, I don't know screw up one fight, lose get one person knocked out and lose them forever. <laughs> All right, will defense. Will defense oppose attack, uh, opposes attacks excuse me, that are mentally based, like confusion. It is defined by a character's resolve and wits abilities and can be modified by equipped items, talents, and effects from spells and potions. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. We're going to want some vitality because we're building tanky. Wits. The wits attribute describes a character's mental acuity. Their ability to observe their environment to pick up on clues. Wits is used to increase spell spell strength as well as increase the magic defense. So spells, this is what you're putting your stuff in. There's no wisdom based and intelligence based. There's just wits. Wits is your, your magic. Okay. Your magic defense. Magic defense allows characters to resist harmful effects from spells and attacks that deal arcane damage. It is determined by a character's resolve and vitality. It can be modified by equipable items, talents, and effects from spells or potions. For some reason, it doesn't mention that it's modified by wits here. We don't really need wits because we're not um, building for magic. And we can build tankiness to it and resolve. This is the important one for us being the tank. Resolve determines a character's ability to endure physical and mental challenges. Resolve is the primary attribute used to derive the endurance, will, and magic defenses. It, is also, it also increases the duration of all of, of afflictions applied by the character. So, afflictions. Afflictions are explicitly bundled sets of status effects that can be applied to, suspended, or fully removed from a character. While some afflictions have explicit overriding or exclusivity rules, most afflictions can coexist with other afflictions. When a spell is cast on a target, it and its subordinate effects and afflictions are all bundled together in a procedurally bundled container created by the spell. 
If these procedurally bundled containers are applied when, while an identical version is in effect, the new version replaces the old. No matter how many effects are on the target, generally the bo only the best bonus and the worst penalty are applied. Some enemies can be immune to one or more afflictions. If so, these afflictions cannot be applied to those enemies. So, there's that. Magic fence, we've been over that. So, resolve does not give you anything as a character. It just makes you really, really, really good at, um, excuse me, as, uh, at defending, at taking hits, at taking debuffs. So that's important to us. We're going to take that. And remember that your attributes in a, in a typical RGB fashion, uh, RGB, <laughs> RPG fashion will affect your skills. And your skills are what are going to be checked for dialogue options and interaction with the world. So we have two points left. And another important thing to notice about uh, the attribute system tyranny is it's not like super special every every even number you unlock a new point no just every time you click it up you get a bonus nine percent six percent three percent i can't click it for some odd reason all right we have two points left let's go ahead and put it on hmm i kind of want to put it on finesse for the accuracy of throwing the lance and the armor deflection but I kind of want to put it on Resolve, because Resolve is great for defense. But I'm going to go ahead and put it on Finesse, because Resolve doesn't really affect your skills much, and I really, really like being able to succeed um, skill checks when I'm interacting with the world. So we're going to go ahead and put it on Finesse. Alright, here are our skills. We have 20 points to spend in our skills. We have Weapon Skills, which are specifically to Combat. And we have Support Skills. Let's go over the weapon skills first, because they're very simple. Dual wielding determines effectiveness of attacks when wielding weapons in both hands. Um, so we're not dual wielding, so we're going to ignore that. One-handed weapons determines effectiveness of attacks using weapons wielded in a single hand, swords, axe, daggers, and maces. That's pretty important to us, because we're using a javelin, which is a one-handed and uh, throwing weapon. Bows. Determine effectiveness of range bow attacks. Yeah, you get it. Magic staff determines oh, sorry. effectiveness of use, attack using a magic staff. Two-handed and alone combat. We're just going to concern ourselves with one-handed weapons. We'll decide how many points to put into that after we go over our support skills. So are there, there are five support skills, and these ones are extremely important. These are how you will interact in dialogue and in with objects in the world this will this is how you will make checks to trick or convince or intimidate or overpower people in and objects in the world so athletics determines the character's ability to traverse difficult terrain as well as their ability to execute complicated moves in combat Athletics is used in dialogue to determine your ability to intimidate or physically overpower someone. Dodge. The dodge skill defends against ranged attacks from bows, javelins, or magic spells. Higher skill ranks will reduce damage taken or even cause enemies to miss their attacks altogether. Dodge, sorry, is not used in dialogue or things like that. Parry. The parry, neither is parry, subterfuge, lore, athletics, and there are other checks that I'm not seeing that I don't remember, or I'm just dumb, and it's because I haven't played this in several months, <laughs> athletics, subterfuge, lore, that might be it, I'm not sure. The parry skill defends against melee attacks and spells, higher skill ranks will reduce damage from enemy attacks and may lead them to miss altogether, so as it mentioned before, parry is for direct melee, dodge is for direct ranged. Subterfuge. The subterfuge skill determines the character's ability to move unseen through the environment, to detect and manipulate hidden traps and devices, and to open locked chests and doors. It is also used in dialogue to determine your ability to deceive or trick the person you are speaking with. Lore. Lore skill determines the character's ability to decipher information and put together clues from fragments of information. This skill is critical for magic users who wish to learn new runes to power their spells. Lore is also used in dialogue to, to determine what you know about the history of the world or to impress others with your knowledge. And that's actually a big thing too. So, I always got confused in the past when 
they'd go over things like the intelligence attribute, which this is how your character puts together clues from the world, because I'm like, I do all that, the character doesn't. But it is actually very important in Tyranny because you will come across things like rune rubbings and stuff, and lore is also, it determines, um, so I mentioned previously that spell creation is completely separate from your abilities and your ability tree. And lore is the measure of how powerful you can make a spell, how much you can modify a spell rune to create different and more powerful spells. So that is extremely important for spellcasters, and it's also a very nice to have in conversation. Um, our guy's not going to be great on lore because he's a beefy boy. <laughs> he doesn't read his books. Alright, so we're going to put some into athletics. A uh, couple in dodge. You know, we don't need dodge. No, yeah, we do need dodge for range attacks. Um, and let's put a few in lore just to get them up to a nice standard. What do I need in here? Alright, now we'll go ahead and put some in one-handed weapons. Let's go ahead and take a little bit of that. Get that up to 40. Beautiful. Alright, so I think that looks pretty good. And we will continue. So there are two things. You can go to Quick Start, which is boring and lame, and no one do this. Don't do that. I'm not even going to go over it. Basically, you skip the conquest, and you just have it generate you one. It's, don't do that. Conquest. This is awesome, and it's super important to your gameplay. So this, uh, as I mentioned before, Evil Already Won, your job is to... Uh, Bring law and order and stuff. The conquest goes over the war before the game starts. So it determines how the war went down and what your role was. And this is really, really big for determining how people in the world are going to interact with you when they meet you. Because you will have a reputation. There will be things you did and said that will have consequences, good or bad. Alright, so we're gonna go next. And we'll get back into the All the world yes, has fallen <laughs> to Kairos. And now the Overlord's eye is on the tears. Our home. The last corner of the world free of Kairos's reign. Two armies. The disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus march south from the Northern Empire. The last realm to fall to Kairos a century prior. In the early days of 428, Kairos's armies arrive at the Gates of Judgment, the mountainous border that we Tearsmen so long believed unassailable. Unable to agree on a unified plan of defense, the various leaders of the Tears sit and wait for each other to deal with the conquerors. Until it's too late. And that is where we will start the conquest. So, during the conquest, you will decide your character's actions during Kairos' invasion of the Tears, shaping the world through which you will adventure over the course of the game. Each choice you make affects your character and how major factions of the Tears respond to you. Your decision matters. Choose wisely. It really does. It will seriously affect how you interact with the people and places in the game. So, an important thing to remember, very important things to remember, the disfavored are really really um i can't think of the word in this moment but focus on the fact that the disfavored are very small but super super strong they're very loyal they're very disciplined they're very focused they are incredibly they're the elite but there are very few of them and they're extremely extremely prejudiced the scarlet chorus are an absolutely massive teeming horde of completely undisciplined randos. Anyone who could pick up a pitchfork or just a fork fork and use it to stab someone, they can join the Scarlet Chorus. Anyone who doesn't want to die joins the Scarlet Chorus. And remember that because it really does have a big effect. Um, the way the Scarlet Chorus works is in gangs. You have gangs of of people who band together or they choose a gang leader and it's completely strength based. If one of the members of the gang thinks that they're strong enough, they may take on the gang leader and 
take ahead of the take over the game and then they're the head and the voices of Narant, the archon of uh, secrets the spy master for kairos who runs the scarlet chorus doesn't really pay any attention or heed to what is happening in the scarlet chorus on the flip side um grave and ash the archon of war who leads the disfavored is extremely connected to every single one of them and they all treat each other as I almost want to say family, but that would get really weird if I used that term, so let's not. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Alright, the Bastard City. Let's read on this first. Named for its position between two realms, the Northern Empire and the Southern Tiers, the Bastard City and its surrounding lands, known as the Bastard Tier, is a melting pot of cultures and a place of commerce and intrigue. The Tearsmen of the South view the Bastard City as a place of wealth and excess, but to the people of the Northern Empire, the Bastard City is little more than a sprawling slum. This little paragraph here comes after the conquest. Tunon the Adjudicator established his court in the Bastard City. From this foothold in the Tears, he and his court of fate binders impose Kairos' law on the conquered land. So that's where you'll start. That's where Tunon is. All right. So the Bastard City stood on the northern border between Kairos' empire and the Tears, built upon a natural harbor of the at the crossroads between the realms, the city was a nexus of commerce. To the Tears, it was the center of all wealth. To a northerner, it was little more than a backwater trading post. Its symbolic status as a gateway to the continent made it a natural first target in Kairos' military conquest. Circumstances were ideal for you to prove your worth as a soldier in Kairos' army. Taking the city would send a message to the rest of the Tears. Kairos' will is insurmountable. And, uh, yeah, we're gonna go over the entire conquest and over the very, very first opening introductory um part region whatever it's very short don't worry about it <laughs> well i'm probably calling it very short and you guys are going to be sitting here it's going to be in 45 minutes by the time we get there and you're going to be like i'm done this this is dumb you don't know how to do a tutorial you're right i don't i'm sorry but <laughs> i'm hoping to get through the combat system and there's a little bit outside of the combat there's a little dialogue there's a little interaction with the world that i hope to show um because Again, this is very casual. I'm mostly doing it for a couple of siblings, and I would love it if other people can uh, benefit from it. But, you know, people get stuck, and I just want to share the game with them. So I'm going to teach them as much as I know. All right, so the way the conquest works is there will be two options for you get to pick one and take part in that, and you don't get to take part in the other one. And then you have uh, two or three, in this case, three uh, objectives you get to accomplish. Maybe it's always three. I think it's always three that you get to accomplish before you move on to the next objective. So here we have infiltrate the tears. History would remember the gates of judgment as the first battle of the conquest, but the real combat unfolded with advanced units of both armies preparing for the coming war. The disfavored and scholar course each had a plan to infiltrate the capital city. Which army did you join? Let's read up on these. Disciplined and battle-hardened, the disfavored are an elite legion in Kairos' army. They spearheaded the conquest of the younger realms, finding themselves always outnumbered but never outclassed. Led by the steadfast and dutiful Graven Ash, whom they follow with obsessive devotion, they are committed to imposing their interpretation of order upon the relative lawlessness of the tears. The legion only tolerates northerners in their ranks, priding themselves on their high standards and cultural purity. Uh, let's not discuss how pure did his favorite are, but you know that's a that's a story for another day. And uh, also, Graven Ash they have this Cree that is his favored, uh, where they say Graven Ash protects, and there's actually a connection that Graven Ash has with his soldiers. And his soldiers can take immense wounds, but Graven Ash can actually take the pain from it for them, every single individual one of them in the whole army from anywhere in the world, onto himself. And they can keep fighting. They will not die. But they're extremely prejudiced, so I don't think it's it's all great. And the Scarlet Chorus. The Scarlet Chorus is little more than a gang of thugs and their captive slaves. Rather than organize under commissioned officers, the organized under yeah, sorry. <laughs> the chorus follows a hierarchy seemingly ruled by whoever has the bravado to command and defend their position. At the head of this chaotic pecking order, the Archon of Secrets, better known as the Voices of Narat, treats the Scarlet Chorus as his personal army. The Scarlet Chorus often suffers tremendous losses after battle, only to swell in the aftermath when captured enemies and collateral prisoners are given the cruel opportunity to join or die. So there's one way I like to view the disfavor in the Scarlet Chorus. 
And that is that in the Scarlet Chorus, the individual men and women are decent people who have been formed into this disgusting parody of mankind who slaughters and rapes and whatever um, because that's what they have to do to survive. And the, the big names, the leadership of the Scarlet Chorus is truly the despicable part. The disfavored I view as the individuals are the despicable, extremely prejudiced, extremely racist, extremely classist ones. While the leadership that is favored is honestly compassionate and intelligent and very decent people. So they have their pros and cons. All right, so we can choose to aid the disfavored scouts. You lent your skills to the elite disfavored scouts to capture a border garrison. Graven Ash insisted that an early victory in the offensive would boost the morale of his troops and diminish the haughty overconfidence of the southerners. Let's go look at Graven Ash. The last of the great northern generals to stand against the overlord in ages past, Archon Graven Ash now serves Kairos as supreme commander of the disfavored legion and is charged with conquering the tears. Graven Ash shares pow a powerful bond with the soldiers under his command and regards each of them as his family. The death of a soldier at enemy hands represents a grievous loss to the old general who bears the burdens of his love with mournful stoicism. Or, you've joined the Scarlet Chorus as they raided villages and small towns, conscripting every able-bodied man and woman into the army. The voices of Neron emphasized the rewards of conscription and enslavement over wanton, blood sh wanton bloodshed. Apparently, his soldiers needed the reminder. The Voices of Narat Known in his official capacity as the Archon of Secrets, the Voices of Narat is equal parts genius and madman. Rumors abound that he can steal the minds of others, though few, if any, are alive to confirm as much. The subjects of his interrogation are never heard from again, and the Archon is able to recall the memories of his victims with startling accuracy. He is the inconsistent leader of the Scarlet Chorus, facilitate. Vacil vacillating? Pfft. Vacillating between commanding from the vanguard and directing his armies in absentia. Despite his strange methods, no one doubts that the Voices of Nara is an accomplished strategist, even suggesting that his madness stems from thinking hundreds, perhaps thousands, of steps ahead of his enemies. Before we make a choice there, we want to check out the other objective. Gates of Judgment. The armies of Kairos took to the battle did I just yell? <laughs> the armies of Kairos took the battle to the Gates of Judgment, trumpeting the opening calls for the conquest of the Tears. The two armies, the disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus, brought their distinctive sense of order and chaos to the assault. You went to battle alongside the army whose approach best suited your strengths. Standing shield to shield with Kairos' ironclad elite, you advance on the mercenary army purchased by the nobles of the bastard city. The Legion wanted to send a message to the Tears that superior breeding and disciplined training would win the day. You rushed with the chaotic mass of the Scarlet Chorus, flanked the Bastard City's army, and drove them to flee. Alright, considering who our person is, a lawbreaker who was taken in by Tunon to be a Fatebinder, and is a big tanky boy, I'm gonna say that we're gonna go straight to the battle, and we're gonna join the Disfavored. The Bastard City learned too late that a military is earned and never bought. The mercenary army quickly found themselves outclassed by the superior tactics and formation of the disfavored. Those few who lived to the end of the battle were rounded up, the weak executed, and the strong enslaved to harm the army haul the army's wagons on the journey south. To judge the enemy. The soldiers of the Tears fell by the hundreds, and Kairos' armies could not agree on how to handle the few survivors they dragged back to camp. Befitting your role, the commanders turned to you to decide the fate of those who occupied prison pens. There were only enough prisoners to support the plan of a single army. The disfavored needed slaves to haul their gear, dig latrines, and keep their pallets warm at night. <laughs> you consigned the survivors of the battle to the subservient role among Graven Ash's noble troops. You gave prisoners the chance to serve in Kairos' army or die. The Scarlet Chorus was in need of extra troops to fill up the vanguard, and your former enemies would occupy those slots nicely. Feeding the Host Against the most optimistic projections, the Disfavored and Scarlet Chorus made short work of the local defenses. They did so well that their armies quickly outpaced their supply caravans. Troops were plentiful, but food was scarce. You only had time to execute one plan to secure provisions. You authorized disfavored troops to confiscate food and supplies from traveling merchant caravans. The tears had already spent ignorant centuries gutting themselves outside of Ty Kairos' law. 
blooding themselves, gutting themselves. <laughs> you authorize the Scarlet Chorus to send their horde out to pillage from farms and villages, spreading the infamy of Kairos's army, prepared the tears for the reality of the impending conquest. We're going to go ahead and go with the other one, and we're going to side with the Scarlet Chorus, because they do depend on having new slaves who they absorb from defeated armies to work in their army. So we're going to side with that. You armed cooperative ex-soldiers with scrap weapons and tossed them into the vanguard of the next Scarlet Chorus, Scarlet Chorus Assault or Harora. Those who survived were welcome to take up the arms and armor of the fallen and eke out a desperate struggle to survive in Kairos' military. After their first victory, you rewarded the new recruits with the opportunity to execute their wounded or reluctant countrymen. Taking the Bastard City The armies of Kairos amassed around the Bastard City, the first bastion of the tears to fall. Both armies longed to storm the walled outpost. The Scarlet Chorus howling for plunder and the disfavored forming an unbreakable shield wall. Your prowess in the field of battle had carried them this far, but there was one more step before total victory. Both of the armies had inspired schemes to take the Bastard City. Which did you support? Alright, so we have three options here. And this is the symbol of Tunan. You led a mixed band of disfavored and Scarlet Chorus scouts over the city walls to sabotage its defenses. You joined the Scarlet Chorus in setting fire to the city and blocking the gates. The defenders would surrender or burn. You joined the disfavored vanguard in a direct assault upon the city gates. No fortification would stand before the unstoppable legion. And this particular decision will actually grant you an ability. So this ability, Warrior's Respite, stay on your ground in the face of defeat during this time when you will regenerate health rapidly, but your damage is significantly reduced. So that's if you side with the disfavored. If you side with Scarlet Chorus, you get a Fire Spell, Searing Palm, which I, I mean, you should make this decision based on story reasons. But if you were purely doing it for the metagaming, I would not recommend this, because you can just build this yourself. Or, Concealing Shadows, create a cloud of obscuring shadows and dust for a short duration. Enemies that use physical attacks against you have a significantly increased chance to miss. During this time, your attacks will also be less effective. Story reasons, though, I'm not really going to consider what the skills are. This kind of sounds like something my big tanky boy would do, but I kind of like this. Hmm. Let's go with this one. Though it was challenging to earn the cooperation of both armies, their shared interest in taking down the city's defenses allowed your scouts to work as a single unit. Once your forces scaled the walls, a mixture of tactics and savagery destabilized the city guard, who quickly lost their command over the defenses and were forced to surrender. Lacking the support of archers or siege weapons, the bastard city fell, bastard city fell quickly to Kairos' superior might. Okay, and I know I said I was going to go through the entire conquest, but I realized this is going to take absolutely forever and has absolutely no effect on the tutorial of the game. It is purely story reasons that will affect how your gameplay and story end up. So for the sake of the tutorial, I'm going to skip the rest of the conquest here because that is all you need to know. The rest of it is purely subjective, purely relative to what you want to do. If you want to roleplay your character, if you want to roleplay as you, and make the decisions you want to make. But from here on out, the rest of the conquest is entirely your decision, and it splits in multiple paths, and I don't want to give any spoilers. So, for the sake of that, I'm going to skip straight to when we are done with the conquest, and we're going to get straight to combat and world tutorial, because that's what everyone has been sitting here for absolutely forever waiting for me to do. I will probably tag it in the video somewhere where you should skip to if you just want to get the com combat and... Uh, open world tutorial. I might make it into two videos, one which is just the um, conquest and one which is, uh, sorry not one which is just the conquest, one which is character creation and conquest and skills, attributes and whatnot, and one which is just how to play the game. So if you already know how to do character creation, if you're already doing your own history and conquest because it's a role play game and you can do whatever you want with that, then I'll just teach people how to play the game now that they're already you know done with it so I suppose that's where we will uh, that's how we'll do that <laughs> so more editing for me but you know what I don't really mind 
might split into two videos. So for the sake of perhaps having another whole video on this, maybe I will go through the entire rest of the conquest all voiced or, sorry, all commented on or maybe not. We'll see how that goes.